Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I hope everybody had a nice lunch and you're not too uh, sedentary and falling asleep on me. I'll try and keep things uh, upbeat so you won't uh, snooze. If I see a couple heads nodding, I'll, I'll, I'll shout and do something to keep you going. Excuse me just a minute here and get my, my timer going here. So I, I'm actually doing a couple roles here. I'm the, uh, been involved with Oath, the Initiative for Open Authentication for a number of years. Oath is a, um, and we'll talk about that, you know, what Oath is all about. And, and I'm also working for an open source uh, German company that does authentication that uses the Oath algorithm. So why do we need authentication? I think everybody here in this room knows why. Uh, fraud is a, doesn't, doesn't sleep, doesn't go away. It's skyrocketing every year we hear bigger and bigger, more better and better breaches and more data being stolen and gathered and whatnot. Uh, we have at least 10 million Americans were victims of fraud last year, over three and a half billion dollars. These numbers are only reported numbers which are really tiny compared to the overall stats of, of unreported numbers. We all know that hacking is, is it's an art, right? And as, as we see, the numbers of companies here. So what do all these companies have in common? I used to show a slide like this about four or five years ago. And I actually, probably some of the people might be in the audience that worked for these companies, but I put up what do these companies have in common? And I showed Google, Apple, Sony, and RSA. At the time, Apple, the largest company in, in America, Google, the largest internet company, Sony, the largest entertainment company, and RSA, the largest security company. The one thing they all have in common, they were all hacked. And I was talking to a bunch of bankers, and I said, so if you don't think you're a target, maybe your bank's just not big enough. And that was it. Initially, they went after all the big targets. So today, if you were to listen to Forrester, Gartner, or some of the analysts, I think the numbers are... 35 to 40 percent of the Fortune 500 companies are now doing some sort of multi-factor authentication, things beyond just standard passwords. That leaves 60 percent of the other Fortune 500 companies and all the other thousands of companies that are not. There are privacy websites that will show you on a daily basis where the hacks are happening. And, and it's outstanding, whether it's doctor's offices, you know, little clinics, uh, yeah, it, it's just amazing, you know, there were 5,000 people here, 10,000 people there. It, it's really ridiculous. I don't know if this thing will work, but let's try it. If I'm connected to the internet, we'll, we'll see a little word. This isn't as, is as recent as I could get it, but you can see the size of the hacks over the years, how, you know, they, they, they're big, and, and they don't go away. They just keep getting more and more of them. And these are just a few of them. I'm sorry? Oh, you can't see? Oh, you don't see it. I see it. How come you don't see it? I'm looking at my screen and it's weird. Why did it not come up? Uh, it didn't come up. Okay, so that's all right. It's just, a, it's a, you'll see it this way. Yeah. So basically, it's just a number of, number of companies have all been hacked, and this is just by size, okay? The, the market size and projections of some of these things. The good news, if you're involved in security, which I, I assume many of you are, you all have jobs, and that's why you're here. And you will continue to have jobs because it's not going away anytime soon. Gartner's projecting the spending is just increasing. Uh, PwC reports that the security budgets have grown double the rate of IT. When, when IT budgets are being shrunk elsewhere on the security side, they're increasing. This is what people tell me. Uh, the cybersecurity sales are, 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 under you, uh, are on the rise all over. It increases of at least 40% last year. So just a little bit about how come I'm not seeing my slides. Okay, let me start this all over again. 
because something just happened. Huh. It was working great up until two minutes ago. Yeah, I should have, huh? Huh. Bear with me one moment. Meanwhile, I could tell a joke, but I'd get totally confused, so I'll try not to do that. I'm sorry? I'm going to just try and start my PowerPoint all over again. It's a good thing for Microsoft, huh? Wow. That's very weird. I have no idea why that happened. Way to go. Hmm. Problem is I was using a uh, different version of... Okay, so we'll try it now. Now do we see it? Okay. Okay, here we go. So, just some statistics. 665 million records have been breached. 4,000 data breaches have been made public. And those are the ones that have just been made public. It's not talking about the ones that are not. An understanding about, just on the credit card side, the U.S. represents 27% of all the credit card volume in the world. And today, we're representing over 50% of the credit card fraud. That's why if you don't have an EMV chip on your card, you will have in another month or so because they're all putting the chips on the cards to protect the fraud. So in 2015, we're seeing bigger and bigger breaches, right? Bigger failures. We heard about some of them today earlier. So, you know, you look at the OPM breach, you look at the a Ashley Madison breach, you look at all these things that are happening. I don't believe they're random. I don't know where they're coming from, but I believe it's a concerted effort to put together a strategy. And if you look at the breaches that have happened, we know just from the U.S. government perspective. We have their fingerprints. We have their airline flights. We know where they're going. We have their social security numbers. We know where they've been. If you put all these different hacks together, you can put a strategy and you can map out what our government is doing. And you can call me a conspiracy theorist or not, but I believe this is what's happening. I believe there are governments that are doing that. They are taking all these hacks that look like they're just hacks for money, but they're not. It's a concerted nation state effort to undermine a lot of what we do. Not good news. So as I started to say about the chip and pin, so if you don't have a chip on your credit card, you will have soon. That's great. It's going to protect the point of sale. But what about online? We all know that everybody here is purchasing lots of things on Amazon and who knows wherever else online. I do it all the time and I'm just, for those guys with Amazon here, I'm amazed at the logistics what you can do. How I can order something that's not run of the mill, it's pretty, it's pretty weird, it's, it's a unique object and I can have it delivered to my house next day or same day because I'm a Prime member. It's just, it blows me away. It just blows me away. But that said, all the online systems are now susceptible to hacking because you do not have that EMV chip protecting your credit card information. So that's where the fraud's moving. Mobile payment, uh, everybody's using, I don't use an Apple Pay. Uh, the fraud on Apple Pay from Visa's standpoint was six and a half percent. With the lowly little magnetic stripe that they've been using for 60 years, Visa historically has had fraud rates of 0.05%. They're getting 6.5%, which is totally unacceptable. Why is that? 
isn't because the Apple Pay is insecure. It's not because the secure element is not secure. It is. It's a very secure system. But the banks, in lowering the friction to get people to sign up, they're opening the doors to fraudsters and letting them in. So when you enroll, they're enrolling fraudsters. So once you're in, you're in. And that's the problem. It's authentication at the beginning. So we know that this is something that happens. You know, you all get these types of emails. I get probably a dozen of these a day at least from every which way place you can imagine, you know. There are many issues, and I, I think some of these security issues are, are really, I mean, we can joke about them. That's at stake. And, and that's really important, as, as we'll see. So there's a number of different types of authentication, right? We have one-time passwords, adaptive authentication, different types of push technologies, and you know, SMS, you know, we have hardware tokens, software tokens. And actually, this is not my, my new presentation. This is my old presentation. But anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Oath is. Oath is the Initiative for Open Authentication, which was formed, actually, it was formed about nine years ago. And it was developed to be an alternative to what was at the time proprietary systems that were out on the market. So you had uh, an RSA, a VASCO, a Secure Computing, and everybody had their own thing. So Oath was an industry-wide collaboration that wanted to unify that. Okay, so we leveraged existing standards, created an open reference architecture for strong authentication. This architecture is free. It's free to download. You do not have to be a member of Oath, although I'd be happy to have you join, but you don't have to be a member of Oath to use it. Many companies use it. If you go to the RSA conference, and you see anybody that's using strong authentication, it's pretty much using the Oath algorithm. Everybody except that three-letter company, RSA. They're the only ones that are still using proprietary algorithms. So really, the reason why, because there were some major challenges, right? Theft or unauthorized access to the data. The inability to share this data over the network and the lack of a viable, viable single sign-on framework. As we know, the e-commerce growth is, is booming. So we don't want to inhibit that. We want to encourage it. So really, what we tried to do is we tried to address these challenges. It's an all-encompassing approach, delivering solutions for strong authentication across all, de all devices, all networks, all the time. Some of the members, as you can see here, they're big companies, little companies. Some people uh, joined, and then they fall off. They don't continue, but they continue using the algorithm, but they don't continue the membership. A little bit about the reference architecture. It establishes the common ground, okay? So there's four guiding principles of Oath. It's open and royalty free. It has device and innovation and embedding within it. It's native platform support, has interoperable modules. Version 2.0 does risk-based authentication and identity sharing. So, as I said, one size doesn't fit all, as you can see. There are three main algorithms. There's the HOTP, there's OCRA, and TOTP. There's uh, event-based, time-based, and challenge response algorithms. They have all been uh, RFC'd by the IETF, then they're all available to use. So in looking at the roadmap, this was the initial uh, choice. We have the different types of authentication methods, credential provisioning, and the life cycle for a public key, public symmetric key container, and a DSKPP, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and the certification program, and some uh, validation and identity sharing. So as you can see, there are a number of types of devices, whether it's a on your phone, on a credit card, uh, as a regular token, there are many different types of, of ways of using the technology. The certification program was, was started about three or four years ago, and there are actually more than these companies. I, I had 30 plus companies have, have developed products, and there are at least 60, 70 products that are currently on the market today. So in looking at the way Oath is structured, we see we have the time-based, the challenge response, the event-based. 
We've been doing provisioning protocols. The portable symmetric key container has been done. Uh, we're working on things, something called a THROD report. So yeah, this is, was supposed to be updated, say in 2015, but that's okay. We updated the RFC uh, status for, for the profiles, and we're uh, working on the provisioning server and valid specification for adoption and work spec. Talking about things such as OTP with NFC and SAML 2.0, and I have more slides, and if I find them, we talk about the authentication framework. Okay, if you look here, you can see we have the client framework and the validation framework, the provisioning. And we have the user store along with the token storage connecting those. FIDO's been around for a few years. Oath has done some of these types of work for with before FIDO with the web oath client API and some of these things we're, we're going to try and work together on the credential provisioning side we've done a, a portable symmetric key container standard format we have the DSK PP the internet draft and uh, over-the-air provisioning that's been worked on along with the uh, current IETF submissions. So really what we like to do is understand the, the whole life cycle support needed for strong authentication, learn the different approaches, as well as supporting the strong authentication and take away the best practices to enable strong authentication in applications. And I had some things on another presentation. If you can bear with me a moment, I want to find the, because I'm talking about some biometric uh, adaptive behavioral biometrics, which is not here, and it has to be, okay? So just bear with me one moment. Ah, that's the right one. Can you see that? No, okay. I don't know why you can't see that. get this slideshow to work here. Okay. So in looking at the timelines of Oath, so here's what we've done. We started out with the HOTP and the reference architecture. We moved into the interoperability demos and whatnot. One of the things that's starting to become important is the risk-based authentication architecture. So you'll have a uh, authentication protocol with the client, and you do a validation between that and the validation framework that you saw a little bit ago. And there's a risk uh, evaluation and a sharing that happens then, and then it merges into the network. So one size, as I said, doesn't fit all. The models that leverage identity sharing, you know, you have the Kintara initiative, the OpenID and the SAML, you know, it's, it's sharing of the multi-factor authentication simple liability. Okay, here is a, a centralized, uh, centralized service model showing the, uh, that the token is validated in, in a uh, validation service. You have used the same token, can be validated at multiple sites. So it's easy integration into websites and then you can leverage that. Is a distributed model as well, which you know, can be standalone system. So you can use the publishing the, the token in a, in a network, and there's no central token lookup service. And then there's a credential, credential wallet with the uh, authentication sharing. We have multiple credentials, and they're dynamically provisioned into one device. So we have here identity federation and oath. So this is something to federate across many different sites. If you know you've been involved in or seen. Uh, the uh, VIP system from Symantec, this is similar to what they're doing. So what about the technology beyond passwords, right? We have things such as adaptive authentication, you know, we've talked about and heard about different methods of geolocation and things like that, and fingerprints and iris scan and voice and facial recognition. And 
The thing about biometrics, they are great, but as we heard this morning, they're irrevocable, right? Once your fingerprints are stolen, they're gone. That's not a good idea. So the passwords, you know, my passwords, I have, you know, probably a hundred different passwords that I use, and they're, they're getting very complex, and they're very hard to remember. And, you know, so you have password keepers, you have ways to store them, and, and unique systems to encrypt them, and, and but th that's not the solution, right? So the question is, is it really you, right? It doesn't really authenticate you. If it did, the fraudsters wouldn't, wouldn't be that successful, right? So behavioral analytics can confirm who you are by what you're doing. So the future is maybe we won't have to remember these passwords at all. If you do some behavioral biometrics, typing in a phrase, uh, your type of behavior will confirm who you are. Might be a little hard for you in the back to see this. But the point of it is that sharing, getting attributes stolen, that's going to happen, right? So we need a way to revoke them. We need a way to lower the friction so that they're easy to use. I used to show a slide with three things on it, or, or uh, three different parameters, cost, security, and convenience. And I've worked for European companies for 19 years now, and Europe is very much concerned about security. They're not concerned as much about convenience. And that's the way it is if you're working for a federal government. They're not concerned about convenience. They're more concerned about security. They're not concerned that much about cost. So you have to weigh those. As, as when biometrics was first coming out you know, 15 years ago, after 9-11, I worked for a company making biometrics. It was Infineon. And they said, Don, every airport's going to have biometric sensor in the access points. So I, I talked to my lady, Maxine, that did the analysis. And there were 70,000 access points in every airport in the United States. Every, every door, right? 70,000 of them. So from a semiconductor perspective, 70,000 chips, that, that's, that's about, you know, three or four uh, wafers, I mean, two batches, you know? It's, it's, it's a week's worth of work. It's, it's not enough to justify business. So it wasn't, it wasn't big enough for them. But they were looking at it wrong. They were thinking that the high security places were going to have biometrics. Now, I belong to a gym, 24-hour fitness. And what do I use when I get into my gym every day? I use a biometric sensor. It's not very secure. I mean, going to the gym, I mean, it's so they let somebody else in for five, ten dollars a month. I mean, what's the big deal? So it's not a question of, was it just security? No, it was convenience, it was tracking, it were many other things. So prognosticators always look at, at the future and I've lived long enough to figure out that most of them are wrong. You know, if you, if you take what somebody says and you hold it against them a couple years later and then you see that it doesn't really work that way. So when I think about behavioral analytics, I find that this is something that, that this might be, uh, might be good for our future because, you know, we have things that other security technologies that don't work, right? Whitelist, black, blacklisting, and things like that. Uh, network act activity logs are generating and they're ignored, right? Because people don't want to do it. It's, it's, it's changing the, the mindset of the people. You know, the attackers shift to targeting individuals. We've heard about these people now where they're having their computers taken over with ransomware and things like that. So this, you know, it, it's amazing what's going on, right? Big data analysis isn't only for the, for the law-abiding citizens, right? I think uh, probably the fraudsters hire more big data scientists than, than Google and Facebook do. So behavioral login, we use the user behavior to log in, it provides security without the personally identifiable pieces of information. It's frictionless. The users don't even know that they're being enrolled or they're being tracked. 
you can control the subscription sharing because what happens is people will log on and then once they log into this system they can pass their computer over to somebody else. This will keep that from happening in things such as e-learning or government tracking facilities. So there's nothing to possess, nothing to lose, nothing to remember, and nothing to fail. No devices that are going to break or fall. So really, what I'd like to do is we're driving a fundamental shift from proprietary systems into open solutions. It's an industry-wide problem where we need an industry-wide solution. Strong authentication to stop the identity theft that's going across all the networks. We want to foster innovation and lower the cost. So when you talk about open source, one of the things that's, that's really key is open source technology lowers the cost. There's no reason why somebody has to spend $35 for uh, a silly little token or, or you know, $10, $15 per user per month just to have, have you know, a one-time password. Those, those things are, I, I can't believe that, that companies like RSA can still get away with selling those things at those prices because uh, there are options out there that are open source that are a tenth of that cost. It's a, it's a fraction of that. Everybody can be using that. There's no reason why they don't have to say the cost is too high. So anyway, with Oath, if you want to download the, the architecture, there it is. There's the, get on the Oath website and you can download it. We do open source, like I said, with the Radius client and Java and OTP support and here's some references and uh, lots more resources. So with that, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to hear them. Sorry my presentation got a little screwed up there for a minute, but I had the wrong one. Thank you.